All right. Um, sorry. My name is uh, Kostya Korczynski, uh, and I will be um, talking about Cloudburst, uh, which is an exploit that would allow um, a user to escape a VMware guest and run, run code into the host. Uh, Cloudburst is a name that David Toll came up with. It's like he, he likes to give code name to stuff, uh, which is um, the reason for that. Um, I'm currently a senior security researcher for MIT Inc., uh, which is based in Miami Beach, Florida. And, um, and yeah, MIT Inc. Uh, has several products, Immunity Burger, Canvas, Silica, and uh, that's if you have heard of the company. And uh, yeah, I'm French, not Russian. Uh, and that's, that's in order to avoid the awkward conversation at the end of the talk when people start talking to me in Russian, and I totally don't know what's going on. Um, Okay, about, uh, about VMware and the VMware security, uh, we found um, a cool quote in the next wave that is the um, NSA newspaper-ish type of stuff. Uh, and they were talking about their uh, net top stuff, which is like some, ki some kind of appliance that would allow um, classified and unclassified data to be running on the same uh, hardware using a virtualization stuff, VMware, in order to have a VM that is unclassified and a VM that is classified. And they said, I'm, I'm reading that there, um, using seven analysts over a 10-week period of, uh, and with some limited input from VMware developers, we explored the ability of the core net top technologies, uh, VMware running on a Linux host, to maintain isolation. The results of this first study were encouraging, no apparent show of uh, stopping flows were identified. So that's, that's their stuff. Obviously, they spent a reduced amount of time. But uh, what I'm going to try and uh, prove with this presentation and this exploit is that um, everything that is probably based on the virtualization technology in order to increase the security or the, I don't know, the separation between classified and classified uh, is as secure as the product that is uh, entering the, um, the virtualization stuff. Uh, and there is a bunch of misconceptions about, um, about um, guest to host escape. Uh, there has been a bunch of vulnerabilities that have, that have been published in the past. Uh, here is a list of some CVE. Uh, one, the few good ones were the uh, one that were unfortunately not default, uh, but uh, used the uh, shared folders uh, functionality of the VMware tools and of VMware in order to be able to uh, do a directory transfer tool stuff and access some files on the file system. Uh, so that's Greg Mac McManus is created for that, uh, as well as um, Core, who expanded the vulnerability uh, to the shared um, to uh, Unicode. Um, one of the cool stuff also was uh, Raffle's work, uh, and he found a bunch of uh, interesting vulnerabilities that would allow somebody to get out of the guest and execute stuff on the host potentially. Uh, one was in 2007, a heaper flow. Um, that was uh, dealing with some I.O. Um, related to the video device. Uh, so this is uh, some stories, and yet uh, in, in, in nowadays, um, you, see, you still see in presentation people who are advising the use of um, a virtualization software in order to improve the security. So this slide... Uh, is taken from a uh, SourceFire person uh, a presentation, and he was doing a presentation about the, the security of PDF. And obviously, as we all know, uh, Adobe and PDF is not like, as secure as, as uh, we want it to be. And he's, um, he's saying that if you want some more information, he can send you a PDF, but you should open it in a VM. Uh, I think, I'm, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, I'm saying that. Um, Thinking that because you're opening a PDF inside a virtual machine will not prevent a, a, a skillful attacker to, first of all, exploit a vulnerability in your PDF reader, then exploit a vulnerability to, to um, increase the privileges if you're not admin, and then uh, exploit the vulnerability that will break out of the guest OS and execute code on the host. Obviously, it takes a lot more skill than the regular PDF open and get owned, but it's not something that is impossible, and hopefully, if the demo works out at the end, we'll see uh, exactly what happens. Um, the first part uh, of the presentation, I will try and go through the steps of uh, the um, the audit that was carried against VMware 
and um, what I did in order to find the flow, and then I will go into the details of the variable MBT. Basically, starting with a very general approach and then going into the details of all the uh, small stuff and then uh, to the exploitation process. Here is a, um, an image taken from the uh, VMware documentation that uh, represents the, uh, well, pretty much what everybody, I guess, knows uh, about virtualization, that you have a layer of hardware, then uh, the, uh, the virtualization layer, and then you have some um, virtualization, virtualized devices uh, on which you can run, uh, well, whichever OS you want, basically. Uh, the important part uh, here, and the stuff that, I'm, uh, that is written at the bottom of the slide, is that every device is uh, emulated on the host, meaning that um, the guest can access those devices, obviously, if he wants to display something on the screen, if he wants to do some network traffic, he will have to have access to the network card. The code that is responsible for the emulation of those devices is running on the host with the privileges of whichever uh, process is uh, running on the host. So uh, on Windows, uh, those devices are located inside the vmr-vmx.exe um, binary. Under Linux, it's um, vmr-vmx. Uh, the advantage of the Linux part is that vmr-vmx is uh, set to AD root, meaning that uh, something happens. Uh, you end up with, with privileges under, the, um, under Linux. Um, so why devices? Uh, first of all, I don't have enough knowledge about virtualization and everything that is um, lower layer, probably like, like Raphael or Joanna have. So I'm stuck with uh, auditing um, code that is uh, ring three-ish, uh, and that is written usually in C, C++, and that does not require low-level knowledge of what's going on in the CPU and stuff. I'm just like reading assembly, guessing if there is something uh, wrong, and then writing the exploit for that. The interesting part of the devices is also that they are common to all VMware products, meaning that they have the same code that will emulate the same device on any of the um, VMware product. Meaning that if you're auditing VMware uh, workstation under Windows and you find a vulnerability in, a vulnerability in one of those devices, then uh, the code will be shared with ESX server, will be shared with Fusion, obviously shared with player because it's pretty much workstation um, stripped down. And, um, and yeah, if the vulnerability is there, it will be there in every single product. And you don't have to rely on the fact that your CPU is an Intel CPU or AMD CPU or whatever you're running. Once again, they run in the host process. Um, they can be accessed from the guest, obviously, either through port I.O. or through uh, memory mapped I.O. They're written in C and C++ most of the time, which is cool because uh, C and C++ are not, well, are still open to some vulnerabilities most of the time. Uh, and the, uh, they have the advantage to uh, sometimes parse um, some complex data meaning that something is sent from the guest, they have to parse that, then they have to render whatever was sent or to um, reply to that. And well, usually if there's some parsing, there might be some bugs, and it turns out there were some bugs. Uh, here is a list of uh, the devices in a virtual machine. Uh, this uh, screenshot is from uh, XP SP3 running on an ESX server. Uh, I wrote down, there's a bunch of devices, a bunch of uh, virtualized devices. Uh, I only wrote the one on the slide that have either uh, some port I.O. available or some um, uh, shared memory um, available. So the first one that is bolded out is um, the video adapter. Why? Because it's most likely the one that will have to parse the most uh, complex data and do the most uh, annoying things. Plus, uh, it has a huge amount of shared memory, and we'll see exactly why. Uh, but it, it looked like a pretty good guess to start an audit of, um, of a VMware um, binary. Then there is a floppy controller ID, controller, keyboard controller, and everything. Um, the one that have been stricken at the bottom, the USB controller and the audio adapter, are only available in the workstation. There is no USB or audio on ESX, meaning that if you want to have something that will also target ESX, which was the point, uh, you probably don't want to look at those. Otherwise, you're stuck with um, workstation. 
Um, what is Cloud Burst? Um, Cloud Burst is really the combination of three, four uh, vulnerabilities that were discovered in, um, in VMware. Uh, workstation, ESX, and uh, whatever. Those uh, vulnerabilities all combined together um, make the exploitation possible on most of the platform. The first one is would be a um, host memory leak, meaning that from the guest, you can read any memory in the host process. Uh, obviously, it's not like the whole memory of the system. It's only uh, the memory of the VMware-VMX binary that is currently running. But it's good enough because if you want to do some fingerprinting, if you want to know where you are, if you want to get some addresses, which is usually useful to disable DEP or go around some uh, protections like that, uh, it's pretty cool. The um, other ones uh, were uh, arbitrary memory write from the guest uh, into the host, meaning that when you're in the guest, you can write with whatever you want wherever you want in the host process memory. Uh, there is one relative, uh, meaning that you have to know the base address in order to write minus or plus uh, relatively to that address. And there is an absolute one, meaning you can say, I want to write something at 800000, and uh, you write that stuff. The uh, fourth one, which is not really a vulnerability, is uh, there were some functions in the, um, in the VMware binary that would allow uh, quick and easy bypass of any DEP enabled uh, stuff. So it's not really a vulnerability, but it really is the job when trying to exploit that on a Vista host or a XP host with DP, which should be the case with this one. Um, the result of the combination of those three is a reliable guest to host uh, escape on recent VMware products. There is workstation. Fusion has a question mark because the code is here, but I don't have a, a Mac, so I cannot test or write the exploit. Um, and ESX server, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for VMware, uh, ESX server is only vulnerable uh, starting um, at version 4.0, meaning 3.5 and under is safe, as in the feature is not default, but the feature turned to be default in 4.0, meaning that uh, um, every, well, imagine the, like the scenario of uh, having 20, 30 uh, virtual machine running on an ESX server, somebody popping one, getting on the host, and then um, getting every single other uh, virtual machine from that host. So that was pretty much the point of uh, uh, looking at um, that. Um, all the bugs in this presentation are fixed. They were fixed uh, in uh, March uh, 2009. It was the, the disclosure process was pretty weird. Um, they were silently patched, uh, as in um, they were patched, but there was nothing in the advisory on March. Uh, then we pushed out the exploit in the uh, Canvas Early Updates program. And then there was like a, a bit of uh, stuff going on. And then they acknowledged, VMware acknowledged the advisory um, on, in, on the 10th of April saying there was really a uh, guest to host escape vulnerability that was patched in the patch two weeks ago. Okay, so uh, obviously since like uh, people seem to uh, hopefully follow that, I, I uh, underlined the fact that the video device would be the most interesting device in order to have a look at what was going on. And uh, all the uh, Cloudburst stuff uh, bugs are located inside uh, the code that is emulating the uh, video device. Uh, the name of the video device is uh, VMware SVGA2. Um, I, there is a, um, a paper that was published recently. Uh, we didn't know about the paper at the time we did the research. Uh, it's called GPU Virtualization on VMware's Hosted I.O. Architecture by Mika Doty and Jeremy Sh um, Sugarman. If you want to have some more information about all the technology that is behind that, you probably want to have a look at that paper. Um, as I say in this slide, I'm not a virtualization specialist. I, I read assembly and try to find bugs in there, meaning that the vocabulary I might be using is probably not the correct one. So if you want to have a, a more correct view on what's going on, uh, you probably want to uh, read that paper. Um, it has a good insight of all the, um, the technology and especially uh, the uh, 2D, 3D stuff um, in VMR. Um, VMware SVGA2 uh, is um, a PCI device that is emulated in the, uh, in the guest. Uh, there is no physical instance of, uh, of that device. Uh, it was totally re-implemented by VMware. Um, 
The, uh, there is a device driver that is provided to most common guests, I understand Windows, Linux, uh, and stuff like that. Only the Windows ones um, support 3D acceleration, um, meaning that if you have a Windows guest that is running under Linux or Windows or um, a Mac, then you can play 3D games now, which is a big thing with VMware. Uh, anything that, can, that uh, is using extensively uh, the Arc 3 can be played or used under VMware now, which is pretty cool. Um, the, uh, it's a user-level device simulation process that is responsible for handling uh, accesses to the PCI configuration and I.O. space uh, of the SDGA device. Uh, understand it's more like a thread that is running in the uh, VMware Touch VMX uh, process. Here is a, a bit of uh, like um, more technical stuff that was taken um, in the presentation of Mika Doty about the, uh, the VMR stuff. You don't have to worry much about uh, what there is. The only thing that is cool here is that you see that there is, some, uh, there is some three different ways that the PCI device will communicate with the, um, with the host process. There is the IO ports, which is you, you do a, an assembly in or out in order to send some stuff. Uh, there is a frame buffer, um, which is like if you have, um, in the recent version, it's 128 megabytes of video memory. This memory is split out in two. There is the, the 2D frame buffer, which is the pixels that will be displayed. So basically, you write some stuff in the frame buffer, and then it will be displayed as like a four byte per pixel. Uh, and um, yeah, nothing much. This is shared uh, with some uh, general purpose DMA memory. Um, the DMA memory is usually used in order to put some, uh, if you're using 3D stuff, you'll store some textures and some surfaces in there so that the host can read that and, and render that. The third and last part, which is the most interesting one, is uh, the FIFO memory. VMware uh, video devices uh, use a FIFO mechanism in order to push command from the guest uh, in the, the FIFO, and then the host read the FIFO, pull, pulls the, um, the commands, and execute that. So there is a bunch of stuff. I will go into the detail um, of that. Here is the um, uh, vertical view of that. So you have an application that communicates with the VMR SVGA driver. Uh, the, the VMR SVGA driver is responsible for writing and reading inside the FIFO and the, uh, the memory region most of the time. And then on the other side, uh, in the uh, host process, there is the uh, emulated device that will read the FIFO, uh, execute command and stuff. Uh, the separation is uh, between the guest and the host is located at the, the FIFO because the FIFO is shared between, uh, well, the guest and the host, which is uh, represented in the, the next slide after this one. Um, I will skip that. Uh, basically, memory map I.O. Uh, are complementary methods in order to perform input and output uh, between the CPU and the device. Uh, either you use port or shared memory. If you do, uh, well, if you use some shared memory or some uh, memory mapped uh, IO memory, whatever you want to call that, uh, every time the CPU tries to access this memory, then it's caught by the device and the device performs whichever operation is asked uh, to perform. Here is my uh, simplified version of uh, what's going on in, in the, um, in the VM VMR stuff. You have a guest, uh, guest virtual machine. The guest virtual machine communicates with the, the virtual video card uh, through I.O. ports and I.O. Uh, memory mappings. Uh, those I.O. memory mappings are um, actually two big regions that are located inside the VMware-VMX process. Uh, this part is important if there is something that to remember for the rest of the presentation is this slide. You get that in your head, uh, mostly because uh, everything that will be described afterwards is related, uh, is um, basically getting out of the gray memory uh, region in the host process. Normally, you, c you can only access those gray memory regions, but due to the bugs, you can like read out of the gray memory region, meaning that you can access the whole memory um, um, space of uh, the VMware Tech VMX process. So like, keep that in mind. 
Here is uh, a screenshot of those, uh, uh, the I.O. port and the frame buffer in the SVG 5.0. You get that by right-clicking on your Windows stuff and going into the properties of your video card, and uh, you will see that. So now I've described a bit what was going on with the uh, SVGA uh, device, and I will go into the detail of uh, the FIFO and how it works and uh, exactly what's, um, what's happening with, um, with VMware. Um, so uh, the SVGA device uh, processes comments asynchronously via lockless FIFO queue. This is from the document. Again, I'm quoting the document. Uh, this queue is uh, several megabytes uh, wide. Uh, and occupies the, the, the memory mapping that is marked in the previous slide as the, the FIFO memory region. There is two different ways, uh, there is two different types of comments that will be processed by the host OS or that will be sent from the guest to the host and processed by the host. Those are 2D comments and 3D comments. Um, the um, 2D comments are pretty much like regular stuff that happens on the screen. Uh, basically, if there is something that has changed in the frame buffer, like you've updated some pixels, then you send a command that will say, please update this rectangle on the screen that is um, 100 pixel wide and, and 100 pixel uh, of height. And uh, you send that, and then the host receives that, and then uh, updates, the, um, updates the screen on the host side. Uh, there are some a bit more complex commands uh, that are related to drawing cursors or storing cursors uh, or displaying glyphs or some other stuff. But usually, it's pretty simple commands like uh, turn, like update the whole, refresh the whole screen, copy a rectangle from point A to point B, and stuff like that. Uh, on the other side, the uh, 3D commands are a lot more complex complex. Uh, I will go into the detail, but basically it's um, the, the FIFO is used as a transport layer uh, for an architect architecture independent um, 3D rendering protocol uh, that, that VMware developed. They abstracted direct 3D in order to make their own stuff and basically from the guest, the driver will send something to the host saying, um, here is the, the, I want to execute this 3D command with these parameters and uh, you have to do that. So it's some kind of like um, rewrote direct 3D stuff or transport layer for direct 3D in order to be able to, to have um, 3D acceleration uh, inside the guest. Um, here are some uh, 2D uh, FIFO operations. Um, the cool thing about those is you can find the code in the, uh, the VMware XF86 drivers because it's open source, you can read that. There is a bunch of 2D, um, uh, 2D commands in there. Everything is defined, there is the names, and there is the parameters and everything, which is not the case for 3D. But it helps a lot if you're trying to figure out the, how this FIFO stuff works, how the, the guest driver is sending command and how the, uh, the comments are interpreted by the guest. Uh, the command number one, for example, is called SVGA CMD update. It takes an X, a Y, a width, and a height, and then it updates a rectangle on the screen. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. The second one is called SVGA CMD rect fill. Uh, this one takes an additional parameter, that is the color, and then it will fill up a rectangle with um, a given color. Uh, so once again, very simple command, uh, not too, too many parameters. Third one is called SVG uh, CMD rect copy that takes an X and a Y, a source XY, a destination XY, a width and a height, and it will copy the rectangle, the source rectangle, to the destination rectangle. Um, you, might, you might already um, know where this is going. Um, here is a, tool, a list of all the uh, SVGA 2D operations. I've colored that because uh, it has changed a lot since the beginning of VMware, but most of them were present since the, the very first uh, versions of VMware. Uh, the one in green are default and accessible by default uh, under, um, under VMware. Uh, the one in yellow at the bottom uh, right of the slide 
are not default but can be turned on from the guest by a special com command, so they can be considered default. Uh, the black ones are not default and require uh, an option to be turned, down, turned on in the VMX uh, configuration file for uh, the, um, uh, the virtual machine. And the ones that are stricken are uh, comments that have been deprecated uh, and are no longer in use. Uh, usually they just return without doing anything. So uh, auditing this part, you pretty much want to focus on the green and yellow and try to uh, find something in there. Um, I would have thought that um, this was a lost cause at the beginning because every single command only takes like four parameters and they're really simple. Um, it turns out it was not. Um, here is the representation of the CMD rect copy um, operation. I've represented the frame buffer by a, a big screen in order to like, like be less um, uh, ab abstract. Uh, so you specify a source rectangle in this frame buffer, and you specify the destination. It will just get all the pixels in this rectangle, copy that in the destination rectangle, and you will see the update on your screen. Uh, the stuff here, the stuff that you have to remember, is the screen that is displayed uh, is actually one of the two grade memory area in the um, host process. It's the frame buffer memory area. Meaning that uh, some weird stuff can happen here. Here is uh, the first bug uh, of uh, rect copy. There, there is some boundaries check on the source rectangle. If you specify an X and a Y that are like outside of the screen, you would, you would think that you should not be able to do that. Uh, fortunately, the checks were signed, uh, and you could pass um, like through some tricks you could get uh, some negative x and negative y, meaning that you're reading memory uh, as the source rectangle uh, that is outside of, of the, the visual screen. What does it mean? It means that you have your gray memory region. Normally, you could only read and write in this memory region. Um, using this uh, command, it means that you're reading outside of the gray memory region and you're writing the result of the read operation inside the gray memory region. Once again, once again, once again sorry, the gray memory region is shared between the host and the guest, meaning the guest has access to the gray memory region. It should not have access to anything outside. So this for bug, what does it mean? It means that if you specify um, negative x and y, you can read any part of the host process memory, or at least the part that are before the frame buffer, which is pretty much like everything you need to, and uh, read that memory and write that in the gray memory region. Then from the guest, you just have to read the, the pixels, and uh, well, it means that you can pretty much read any part of the host memory from the guest uh, without too much trouble. Um, so that's the, the first vulnerability that was in the 2D code. Uh, remember, the rect copy operation only took six parameters, and it was like only x, y with height, and it turns out to be vulnerable. Uh, as uh, an addition, this uh, vulnerability has been there since the, pretty much the very beginning of VMware, uh, and you could do that because it's like a very basic, one of the first 2D commands that was uh, added to VMware. Uh, it was only found in 2009, at least publicly. Um, the rect copy operation, obviously, you're thinking, or you should be thinking, if I can um, have a negative uh, source uh, abscess and, a, um, and uh, a negative source x and y, then I could probably do that with the destination. Uh, and this is correct. Unfortunately, the checks are a bit tighter on the destination rectangle, meaning that... Um, you can have, uh, you can send the command. Uh, you can, what you can do is um, fill your frame buffer with pixels, those pixels being not real pixels, but actually uh, data you want to write in the host memory. So you put that in the gray memory region, you invoke the command, uh, the CMD rect copy operation, and th those fake pixels will be copied outside of the gray memory region, and it will, they will be put inside the, um, the host process memory. Uh, which is pretty cool. It means that you can, uh, that's an arbitrary write. It's a relative write because the negative x and y are relative to the first pixel of the frame buffer, meaning that uh, you will write 
10 bytes before the frame buffer, 100 bytes before the frame buffer, but if you don't know where your frame buffer is, uh, then you cannot really um, like have a reliable write, which is why the previous uh, one is pretty useful, because with the memory leak from the host into the guest, you can have the address of the frame buffer inside the host memory region, and then you can use uh, the write uh, primitive in order to get that. The problem is that you can only uh, write uh, in the few pages before the frame buffer. And unfortunately, in our test, there was nothing really interesting in those pages. Uh, the checks uh, were not allow allowing you to write wherever you wanted, only those first pages uh, right before the frame buffer. And it turns out to uh, not be useful for um, exploiting or fully exploiting VMware. Uh, here's a summary um, of, of the previous slide. Once again, a guest can read and write into the frame buffer. It's your pixels. It's what you want to display on your screen, so obviously you can have access to that. Uh, the frame buffer is mapped in the host memory, meaning that the CMD direct copy bugs mean that one can um, have a def default unlimited arbitrary read of anything that is in the host process and uh, obviously recover the data by reading the pixels. And uh, the uh, second one means that you have a default, unfortunately limited arbitrary write. You can write whatever you want uh, only in the first uh, pages before the frame buffer. So at this point, it's only like pretty much the beginning of the audit, but it turns out that it's gonna be fun. Um, and um, and we'll go on with some other bugs and how to uh, not click them all together. Here is another cool uh, command that is unfortunately not default. Uh, it's the CMD draw glyph. Draw glyph take as parameter a x, a y, and then a bunch of pixels, and it will like just put those pixels whenever it was told to put them. Uh, it requires a command in the VMX uh, configuration file for the, um, the workstation uh, that is svga.esglyph uh, equal true. Uh, so it's not, unfortunately not default, but as you can probably guess, uh, there is absolutely no check on the X and the Y, meaning that you're giving out a bunch of pixels and you say write those pixels at X and Y. If you're specifying your X and Y to be minus 100 or minus 200 for stuff, then you're writing this bunch of pixels uh, in the host memory um, area. Um, this means that you have a non-default uh, unlimited arbitrary write. Once again, it's a relat relative write because it's minus X and minus 1 compared to the first pixel of the frame buffer, you still have to know the address of that first pixel in the host memory in order to have um, something that would be um, a lot better to, uh, to exploit. So at this point, we have pretty much, um, unfortunately, like a memory leak. We can leak any ad uh, anything from the host into the guest, but we cannot really write by default anything uh, anywhere from the guest into the host. So we have to continue searching and uh, hopefully try to find something else. Uh, this is why this is how this is when well we pretty much went through all the 2D commands and turns out there is nothing that would allow a default write. So we turn to uh, 3D. 3D uh, was uh, introduced um, recently in the VMware product. They actually, the th first 3D commands appeared in VMware Workstation 5.0 in April 2005, according to the documentation again. Um, they were disabled by default at the time. You have to add something in the .vmx in order to get there. Uh, the cool thing is that they became default with Workstation 6.5 and whichever version of Fusion is, uh, shares the code with 6.5. Uh, there is a checkbox now. It is um, Accelerate 3D Graphics under the, uh, the configuration uh, option of the, of the VM. Um, and if you check that box, then uh, the VM will advertise that it can do 3D. So you can install the 3D and run some 3D stuff. The, the cool thing, or the annoying thing for VMware, is that even if you uncheck the checkbox, the code will be executed. Meaning if you're sending through the FIFO or 3D command, then uh, it will be executed and will pop an error message saying, sorry, I can't execute that. But the error message is popped after the execution of the command. Uh, meaning that even if you do not enable uh, 3D, then uh, you're still vulnerable, which is cool for ESX4 because ESX4 has the exact same stuff. You would think that there is no need 
for a virtual machine in, a, in, in an ESX to have 3D because you only connect either through the console, which is VNC, or through terminal server, stuff like that, meaning there shouldn't really be a need for um, 3D there. The cool thing is that the code is always shared between all the versions of VMware, and you get uh, 3D operations enabled in uh, ESX4 uh, release candidate uh, by default. So you can also exploit all the 3D commons that will be described. Obviously, the 2D commons are enabled on all the machines, meaning that the mirror leak also happens on ESX. But on this one, uh, it turns out to be pretty useful. Unfortunately, the bug died before ESX4 final. Uh, so we only did the proof of concept on ESX4 um, release candidate. Um, a few words about uh, SVJ 3D. It's a, a simplified and idealized adaptation of the Direct3D API, according to uh, VMware. Uh, it has a minimal number of distinct commons. There is no public documentation about it, as far as I know. Uh, if you look at the, um, the current XF86 drivers, there is some definitions for some 3D constants, but there is actually no 3D commons and no code at all uh, for 3D stuff. Um, the thing that will be useful for the rest of the presentation is that it uses contexts like Direct3D. A context is a big structure that will be allocated in the host, and uh, this structure will hold all of the uh, 3D relevant uh, variables that you can uh, set. Sorry, that you can set uh, through Direct3D calls. Uh, such as render states, light data, etc. I'm not a 3D specialist, so that doesn't mean anything to me except names in the in or or symbols in the banners. Um, here is a list of all the 3D operations. Uh, there is a bunch of them. As you can see, there is some define um, commands, some set commands, and stuff like that. Um, the way it works is exactly like 2D. There is, you send through the FIFO, you send the command you want to invoke, then a list of the parameters. The cool thing is that every single 3D command is enabled. Uh, there is no such thing as uh, non-default 3D command, meaning that if you have 3D, you have access to all of them. Um, so. Uh, starting from there, you can, uh, well, we uh, had a look at all the um, 3D commands one by one uh, in order to see what they were doing without previous knowledge of uh, Direct 3D, so it was pretty painful. Um, the, cool, the cool stuff is that there is a bunch of set commands. Uh, set um, will, will take uh, whichever you, like, the variable you want to set and the value. Um, there is, um, there is like, for example, this common set render state. Uh, most of the uh, set commands appear to be flowed, um, which uh, turns out to be uh, pretty interesting. What happens is through the FIFO, from the guest, you send a comment saying, uh, I want to invoke the common set render state, and I want to set this state to this value. The state is an index in an array. Uh, and as you can see here, it will read the index, then the value, then write the value at the uh, index inside the context, but there is absolutely no bound checking on the index, meaning that usually index will be something, or the, the, render, st the render states will be something between 0 and maybe 32 or something like that, but you can pass minus 16 if you want, you can pass 1024, and you will like write some memory outside of the context, and, um, and do some stuff. So this set render state common gives you um, an arbitrary write, but once again, it's a um, relative write. If you look at the code, you're writing something at ESI plus EDI times four plus 50, meaning that if you don't know ESI, um, then you don't really know where you're writing your stuff. You're writing something before ESI, after ESI, you don't really know where ESI is, which is where the uh, memory leak comes useful because you can leak the address of the context that was allocated thanks to the um, 2D um, rect copy bug, and then uh, your, your, your relative memory write turns out to be uh, pretty reliable. Um, there is another um, like stuff, another trick that can be used. Uh, this is the set uh, light, light enable code. Uh, the light enabled code reads a pointer in the context and writes something at this pointer. 
The cool thing is that since we have a relative memory write uh, inside the context, we can basically override this pointer, then invoke the um, uh, set light enabled command, and then from the relative write primitive, uh, meaning write something relative to the beginning of the context, we get something that is an absolute, absolute memory write, meaning that we've overwritten the pointer and then uh, something is written uh, at this pointer. Um, so the uh, pointer is located at context plus 648 if you want to have a look at that. Uh, there is many more bugs, like pretty much all the three comments were pretty bad. Uh, set render target um, as a signed bounds checking, meaning that you can pass negative parameters to that. Uh, set clip plane as no bounds checking. Uh, set transform as no bounds checking either. Uh, so all those comments uh, are allow you to have some um, um, like write operation from the guest into your host memory. So you've seen at, at this stage, we have a bunch of vulnerabilities that would allow some memory leak from the guest, in, from like to leak some memory of the host inside the guest, and some uh, arbitrary memory write from um, the guest into the host. So now we just have to like get all of this, put this all together in order to like write something that would be that would be a reliable exploit uh, at some point, uh, which will happen. OK, um, here are a few requirements for uh, exploring those vulnerabilities. Um, we have to be able to read and to write directly into the frame buffer and the FIFO. We have to read and write directly into the frame buffer, obviously, because if we want to recover the result of a memory leak, we have to read the pixels on the screen in order to get those results. If we want to have a, a, like to exploit an arbitrary memory write, we have to put whichever pixels we want into the frame buffer, and then this, uh, this will be uh, sent uh, to the host. So uh, there is some direct 3D APIs in order to have access directly to the uh, frame buffer, not the FIFO, unfortunately. Uh, but most of them are checked and sanitized and turns out not to be uh, extremely cool. So the solution was to write our own driver inside the guest in order to be able to access direct, directly uh, the memory pages without having to care about uh, anything else that, that uh, would slow us down. Um, it can, um, the one we did sits on top of the VMware uh, video drivers. Um, it's easier this way because you have less to code, but you don't need that, meaning you don't have to have VMware tools inst inst installed in the, um, in the guest in order to exploit that. Uh, you just have to write a lot more code and a lot more video driver code, which turns out to be uh, extremely painful. Um, and this way, we can map the FIFO from the, like inside the guest. You map the FIFO. Those are just like memory regions that are accessible uh, in Ring Zero. So you map the FIFO, you map the uh, frame buffer, and you can do whatever you want. So the only the real requirement is to have admin rights inside the guest which is most of the time not too complex, uh, either using some local privilege escalation or compromising somebody who is already um, like admin rights or uh, getting in the VM, for example, using a worm or any wormable exploit, uh, think honeypots and stuff like that. They, they get on all day in order to recover some data. So just like get there, you have admin rights, you run the driver, and then you're good. Um, here is um, a few a few steps uh, for the um, exploitation process under uh, under that was our first attempt uh, on Vista. The first step, or which is no longer required after the um, turning relative write into uh, absolute write, was to leak the base address of the frame buffer inside the host memory. Once again, every single relative stuff, uh, a rel relative leak we're going to do. Uh, uh, is based on the address of the pixel 00, zero because we're reading minus 50 from that pixel, minus 100 from that pixel. So we have to have this, uh, this address. It's pretty uh, easy to um, do that under Vista because right before the frame buffer uh, in the host memory, there is the address of the frame buffer. Uh, so you just have to, write to leak the 16 bytes before the frame buffer uh, to get there. And it's, uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty fast. Um, under Ubuntu, we did um, a, a relative leak brute force. Uh, you just like um, 
you pretty much know where you are. Most of the time, there is a bit of randomization or a bit like of uh, changes in the frame buffer base address. So you uh, leak, you try to leak the content of the VMware binary, uh, which is most of the time at a given distance. So you leak, you leak, you leak, you change the address until you reach the PE header and or the ELF header, sorry. And once you reach the health header, you know the distance between the beginning of the header, uh, which is always mapped at the same spot, and the uh, base address of the frame buffer. So that was the second stuff we used to exploit that on Ubuntu. It turns out to be a bit slower, but um, almost as reliable. Under XP and Vista, uh, we tried another thing that is um, an absolute memory write using the trick with the set light enable. So you do an absolute memory write at this address. It turns out that since the frame buffer is 128 megabytes, it takes a huge portion of uh, the host process memory. And it's always pretty much mapped at the same address or between the same addresses, except on the EPC, obviously, which is where I'm doing the demo, which turns out to like, have changed a lot. But um, uh, other than that, you just like write something in your frame buffer, and then you or you write something at a given memory address. Then you scan your frame buffer, and then by subtracting the uh, the position relatively to the beginning of the frame buffer, then you have the the absolute memory uh, location of the frame buffer in the host. Um, then uh, once you have uh, the address of the frame buffer in the host memory, you basically cycle between leaking and writing. Leaking, leaking, writing, leaking, leaking, writing. Uh, the first step of the leak is usually to leak the P header or, or the health header in order to know where you're, uh, what the version of uh, VMware uh, workstation or whatever you're in. Um, and then once you have that, you have a bunch of addresses that you have coded into your exploit, and you can uh, leak overwrite trigger, leak overwrite trigger, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, we'll see exactly uh, how it looks like. Here is a screenshot of what the leak looks like. As I told you, we, uh, when you're triggering a leak, you're, uh, you're getting some uh, data from the host into the frame buffer, which is visualized by uh, the screen that you're seeing here. Uh, the way we do that is always using the first line of the frame buffer. So when you're magnifying the first line of the frame buffer here in the VM, uh, which is um, uh, at the bottom, you see a bunch of weird pixels uh, that are located here. Uh, those weird pixels are actually the content of the host memory that was leaked into the guest. Since in the guest you can read all the pixels of the screen because it's your screen, your that's your, your stuff. Uh, you can read that and um, then um, recover the information you were you you needed. Um, when dealing with DEP, uh, there was a, uh, like something that was extremely interesting, and that, that is the fourth uh, vulnerability, but that is not really a vulnerability, that's more a functionality. When you want to exploit that on ESX4 or, uh, or uh, XP and Vista with DEP enabled, you have to care about NX and the fact that you cannot write and execute anything you want anywhere you want. Um, in order to uh, help us, uh, apparently VMware-VMX provides uh, some virtual protect wrappers, uh, and those wrappers actually take their parameters from the data section of the binary. Um, this is extremely useful because it means that most of the time when you have to uh, disable DEP and stuff like that, you have to forge your stack and do some stuff. Here, it means that you just have to override two parameters in the data section. Data section is always at the same location. You can do that with your absolute memory write uh, once you've, you've fingerprinted your, um, your VMware version. And then you call the wrapper by overwriting a function, a function pointer and calling the function pointer. Uh, and then it will just switch the, uh, the protection to uh, read, write, or read, execute. Uh, turns out to help us a lot uh, when exploiting that because you don't have to forge your stack frame and everything. You just have to uh, exploit that this way. Um, I will, um, well, this is, there is 12 steps uh, in the first uh, exploitation attempt that we did on, uh, on Vista, I think it was. Uh, this, I, I will like fly through that, but it's pretty much to uh, make you understand that nowadays, uh, as pretty much was, uh, well, like all the presentations nowadays tend to um, um, uh, point out, it takes a lot more than a single stack overflow and then overwriting EIP in order to get a reliable exploit and to get something that would work. So, um, yeah, it takes 
12 steps there in order to go through like um, executing something into the guest to executing something into the host. First step is uh, leaking the frame buffer address um, into the guest, then uh, leaking the PE header in order to have the uh, version of the VMware binary. Then we uh, leak some more uh, structures. Those structures are needed in order to get the address of the context, the 3D context, uh, and do some stuff. Uh, leaking the 3D context is not really uh, longer uh, useful anymore thanks to the uh, relative to absolute right stuff. Uh, then you overwrite the virtual protect wrapper parameters in the data section. Then you overwrite a function porter. Uh, we used um, a 2D command uh, 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 function porter that, that is triggered uh, by a 2D command because we're still sticking into the uh, SVGA device. So uh, we call the um, uh, virtual protect wrapper. At this point, we have something that is read, uh, read and writable. Then um, we uh, write the whole shell code into this memory area. Then we overwrite, once again, the virtual uh, protect um, wrappers parameters to something to this memory area. Then we switch the page back to read and execute. Then we overwrite another function pointer with something that is pointing to that. And then we execute that function pointer, thanks to the 2D command. Uh, and uh, then we have something that works on uh, Vista SP1. Um, obviously defeats ASLR and NX by uh, the fact that we're leaking all the address we want and the fact that the VMware binary is always uh, mapped at the same address. And, uh, and that's pretty much it for Vista. Um, so at this point, uh, we have an exploit. But then once, uh, once you have that and once you have execution on the host from the guest, you have to ensure to uh, have a communication channel between the host and the guest and you pretty much. Uh, most of the time you will just say or you will just assume that there is networking on the host or there is something else. Uh, we preferred to assume there was nothing there and we didn't want to rely on any of the functionalities that could uh, be disabled by the administrator and stuff like that. So what we came up with was uh, most def over DRX3D, which is uh, you tunnel your shell, the shell you got on the host, um, over BMP. Um, over the frame buffer, which is um, uh, pretty interesting. So MOSDEF is something that Dave came up with. It's, uh, uh, according to his definition that I don't really understand, it's a retargetable position-independent code C compiler that supports dynamic remote code linking, and it's written in Python. Um, basically, once you've overflowed the process, you can compile whatever you want uh, inside that process, and it will report back to you. Um, um, so what we wanted to have is to ensure host, uh, host really host to us uh, communication or host to guest without relying on stuff that can be disabled. We assumed there was no networking between the guest and the host, meaning you can just not have a bind shell on the host and then do that. Uh, we assumed there was no VMCI because it's disabled by default. And we didn't want to uh, deal with VMRPC because uh, it can be disabled in the configuration stuff. Um, the idea is was to tunnel the shell over the frame buffer because we like the fact that once you're like touching something that is in one component, you will not use anything that is in another component of the stuff. So we stick with the SVGA device and we stick with the frame buffer and do everything. Uh, and what we wanted to do is do that in ring three uh, in order to add a bit, a bit of spice because, uh, well, you cannot access the, the, the you can access obviously the frame buffer and, and do that in ring zero. But uh, after that, if you want to have a layer of TCP IP communication in ring zero, it's pretty painful. Uh, while it's pretty easy to have that in ring three, so we decided to try and have access to a frame buffer in ring three. As I told earlier in one of the previous uh, slides, uh, you can do that with direct 3D APIs. So um, we'll go over exactly what we do. On the guest side, we, uh, we will create and manipulate objects, surface, um, actually surfaces, uh, in the video card memory off screen. Off screen means um, you have 128 megabytes for your frame buffer, you have your pixels, uh, and, uh, and after those pixels, you have a bunch of memory that I told you was used for uh, surfaces and, and textures and stuff like that. So what we're going to do is use the Direct3D APIs in order to write 
uh, fake surfaces in there, and those fake surfaces will actually be something that will be uh, um, grabbed on the uh, host uh, side, interpreted, and then written back, and then executed. Um, so there is create of, s of screen plain surface. Uh, the only thing, if you want to play with that, you only have to care about the fact that you want 32 bits per pixel. Otherwise, uh, that will be uh, painful. Uh, and then there is a D3, DX load surface from memory. So you just uh, give a bunch of uh, bytes, and DX3D will load those bytes off screen into the frame buffer. And, um, and then there is um, safe surface, surface to file in memory. The problem is that there is no safe surface uh, to memory directly. You can only save that as a file. So, uh, and there is no raw format, so you have to save that as a BMP, which is why when you're grabbing back the stuff from the frame buffer into the guest in order to send that back to you, uh, you have to parse the BMP that will, um, th that is actually a fake BMP, uh, but that will uh, actually has, have the uh, answer to your um, request uh, in there. Uh, on the host side, uh, once we've exploited so um, once we've exploited the bug on the host side, we run a shell code. The shell code will run a MOSDEF listener on localhost and then thread out another um, thread. Uh, this thread's job will be to scan uh, the frame buffer in the host memory, find a signature. Once the signature is found, extract the data, send that to the locally bound MOSDEF, receive the data then put that back into the frame buffer, and then on the guest side, the guest side will get the surface again and, and parse the data uh, like that. Um, so this way, we tunnel our shell over the frame buffer, and since most dev is acting sequentially, there is no concurrency issue most of the time, uh, but we just have like a loosey semaphore uh, scheme in order to be sure that there is no reading and writing of the same surface at the same time from both the guest and the host, which shouldn't happen. So uh, the result that we, um, that we have uh, for that is, um, here is the, that's a diagram that is taken from the uh, HP NetTop stuff, where they have uh, um, over um, SE Linux, two virtual machines. One is doing classified, the other one is doing classified. And they're supposed to be totally separated. There is no, uh, there is nothing that should be uh, doing anything between the guest and the host. There is nothing that could uh, make communicate to the two virtual machines. So by, um, by building this uh, thing, uh, by like, Imagine going through internet, exploring the unclassified machine, then you get pretty much a shell on the host, and then you can build also some type of like bridge between the classified version of that and the unclassified version. Um, we didn't do that because we don't have a HP net top, but we did that with like some uh, um, uh, Vista SP1 stuff, uh, which is not as good as SE Linux, but it's pretty good now. Um, so uh, I would, there will be a demonstration, um, hopefully, after the uh, conclusion. Um, a few misconceptions about, uh, about um, virtualization is that it's, most of the people uh, would think it can be taken as a, 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 a security layer, as something, if you run something in a VM, then you're, um, you're safe. Uh, this is totally not the case. Um, it's, it acts as probably as an additional barrier that an attacker has to, um, to um, jump over in order to get there. But uh, it's not impossible. And uh, as, as hopefully proven with those slides, uh, there is a bunch of stuff that can be done between the guests in order to get into the host and stuff. Um, once again, we only did the first device uh, that, that was in the list. Uh, and everything is about that first device. Um, given the current bu bug primitive, uh, you can uh, defeat everything. Uh, if you have a memory leak and a memory write like we have, uh, you can defeat ASLR. There is no need to randomize any of the memory because uh, you can leak it and then recover the pointer and then you're done. Uh, you can defeat NX, obviously. That was, well, uh, the, the VMware um, virtual protect wrapper ha helped a lot uh, for that. But uh, yeah, you can, like, do, do fancy stuff. Uh, one of the stuff also that, uh, that is like, if you're trying to patch something silently in 2009, 
Um, it's not going to happen. There's always people patching binary thanks to Alvar's tools and others. Uh, but um, if there's if you're like trying to hide something in a patch, that's that's not going to happen really. Um, and one thing also that that is pretty weird, and I don't really know uh, what it happened, is that. Uh, if a feature is not needed for a branch of your product, I would think uh, here about the 3D stuff for ESX, uh, there is no need for the code to be included in the release, and there is no need for the code to be executed if somebody has unchecked the, the checkbox that says, uh, I don't want 3D support. Um, so now I will try and demo that. So there is like a bit of warning here, is um, having a VMware an uh, XP under XP under EPC is probably not the best idea I've had uh, because it's um, extremely slow and not extremely uh, reliable. Um, so it works usually, but uh, we'll see. So the way I'm demonstrating that is that I'm going to use Canvas in order to uh, first exploit MSO8067. Like we have uh, an XP on the uh, other box. Uh, let's see if I can show that there. So we have a vulnerable XP on this box here. Um, I'm going to get into this uh, virtual machine uh, by exploiting MSO8067. Okay, you have to see that, really. Okay, it takes a bit of time because the, um, like, I have a crappy hub and everything. Um, so uh, the first step, well, the, the, the stuff Canvas is doing is fingerprinting the other machine, then detecting its uh, XPSV2 English, then getting the target, uh, the correct target for um, MSO8067. Then now it's getting the node. Uh, so the, that's what it looks like now. Um, I'm not sure it's really visible, but the IP of the attacker is 10.10.1. .10 the IP of the virtual guest stuff is 10.10.3. .10 the IP of the host is 10.10.2. So at this stage, I have a shell. Obviously, I'm an administrator because uh, that's MSO8067. It's running a system. Uh, so I should be able, I'm selecting the node by uh, clicking on it. So you see it like changes color, it's fun. Um, and then you click on, uh, well, the Cloudburst stuff. So that's where it can do fancy stuff or crash my VM or stuff like that. We'll see. What it does is it will upload the sys, um, the dot sys, the driver, and as well as the uh, most defer direct 3D uh, thingy. Uh, and then if everything goes uh, correctly and the stuff is not crashing, uh, it will. There will be a second node that will appear, and this node will have uh, the IP 10.10.2, meaning the um, host. Uh, and then I will like try and take a screenshot of it. So here it appears to be working because we got the second connect back, which is the lines that are like appearing at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so we got the second node here. Here, the IP of the second node is 10.10.2, uh, .10 um, meaning that uh, we have currently a shell on the, um, on the host. What happens is that, as you see, there is a, a red link between 10.10.1 .10 and 10.10.2. .10 it's actually not correct, but because it should be a red link, well, it's, there is no abstraction layer for that, but everything is tunneled through the frame buffer to 10.10.3, and the packets are actually coming from 10.10.3 to 10.10.1. Now, if I'm selecting this node and going into uh, the commands, give you a screen grab. Uh, 
Screen grab. So it will take a bit of time. Everything that we're doing now, we're sending a shell code uh, whose um, aim it is to take a screenshot. The shell code is sent to 10.10.3 tunnel over the frame buffer to 10.10.2 executed. Then the, the, the screenshot itself is tunneled back through over BMP through frame buffer to 10.10.3, and the packets are coming back from 10.10.3 to 10.10.1, which turns out to be like a lot of going back and forth stuff. Uh, And now we should have a screenshot, except I don't see exactly where I'm clicking. Okay, here's the list for screenshot stuff. And here is the screenshot of the host this time. Okay, here's the screenshot. So uh, on the host here, uh, what I wanted to point out, I have Process Explorer. You can see VMware is running. There is immunity debugger for like advertising purpose here on the test bar. Um, and um, what I wanted to show is that the VMware-VMX process is running with DP enabled. So this is the like one cool scenario case, and it's even working on the EPC. So uh, it's awesome. Uh, that's uh, that's it for your presentation. Uh, if you have any question, feel free to uh, come and talk to me after your presentation. Thank you.